Welcome to USDTL's Fingernail Collection Instructions video. Materials needed USDTL Collection Supplies USDTL Custody and Control Form Metal Nail Clipper Isopropyl Alcohol Gem Scale Viewing of the specimen at all times by the donor and collector prior to sealing the specimen container is required. Do not mix fingernail and toenail specimens. Do not collect toenails if client is diabetic or suffers from peripheral artery disease. The assay requires approximately 100 milligrams of specimen. This equates to at least two millimeters of nail from all 10 fingers. As a guide, a quarter is about two millimeters thick. A gem scale is highly encouraged to achieve the most accurate specimen weight at the time of collection. Prior to each collection, place the clippers in a 70% or a 91% isopropyl alcohol solution for 10 minutes. Do not use an ethyl-based alcohol solution. Have the donor wash their hands with soap and water prior to specimen collection. Examine the donor's nails before beginning the collection. Make sure they are free of all cosmetic treatments. All cosmetic treatments must be removed prior to collection. For example, polish, artificial acrylic, gel, or silk overlay. When removing fingernail polish prior to collection, a non-ethanol-based polish remover should be used. Verify the donor's identity with a government-issued photo ID. On the custody and control form, do the following. Once verified, mark the picture ID verified box on the custody and control form. Record the donor's ID number. This may be the social security number, driver's license number, medical record number, employee number, or any other number of your facility's choosing. Record the donor's name. Mark the specimen matrix and location. Mark the appropriate reason for testing. Mark the panel ordered for this collection. Record the collection site facility information if it is different than the account information at the top of the form. Open the collection supplies in the presence of the donor. Have the donor clip their nails as close to the nail bed as comfortable over a plain sheet of paper. Fold each side of the collection foil up to form a tray. Once clipping is complete, pour the nails from the sheet of paper into the foil tray. Once the required amount of specimen is collected, fold each side of the foil tray inward to secure the nails and place the folded foil into the specimen collection envelope. Write the donor ID number from the custody and control form on the envelope in the test subject ID section. Place the long barcoded specimen seal from the custody and control form across the bottom of the envelope. Make sure the sticker seals the flap of the envelope securely. Have the donor read and initial the first sentence on the envelope and date and initial the barcoded specimen seal where donor initials is indicated. The collector should then read, date, and sign the second sentence of the envelope and record the specimen weight if available. The donor and collector should both confirm that the test subject ID number on the envelope matches the donor ID number on the custody and control form, and that the control number from the barcoded sticker on the envelope matches the control number on the custody and control form. Date, sign, and print the collector name in step four of the custody and control form. Have the donor date, print, and sign their name in step five of the custody and control form. In the presence of the donor, place the top copy of the custody and control form in the outer pocket of the security bag. Place the envelope in the other pocket of the security bag 
and seal the bag. The additional copies of the custody and control form can be distributed at the discretion of the collecting facility. Place the specimen envelope in an appropriate specimen transport over wrap and contact your courier for pickup. Thank you for watching our collection video. If you have additional questions, please feel free to contact our Client Services Department at 800-235-2367 or email them at clientservices at usdtl.com. Hello, I am Joe Jones and I'm Senior Vice President here at USDTL. Thank you for taking time out of your day to visit us here at our laboratory. We receive a lot of questions on how do we process fingernails for drugs of abuse testing. Today, the purpose of this video is to walk you through this process in a stepwise fashion so that you can gain an appreciation of how the testing operates. But first, we must receive the specimen into the laboratory. Specimens arrive at our facility Monday through Saturday via common commercial couriers such as FedEx, UPS, and U.S. Mail. The specimen packages are inspected for signs of obvious tampering. The individual specimen package is removed from the courier overwrap, opened, and the specimen and paperwork are removed. Again, the specimen itself is inspected for signs of obvious tampering. The shipping label and chain of custody number are scanned into our system. This allows us to know if and when a package has arrived and which samples were in the shipping package. To accession the specimen into our computer system, the technician scans the barcode at the top of the chain of custody form and the matching peel and stick barcode that the collector affixed to the specimen. If these two scans do not match, the computer system does not allow the technician to continue. The specimen is rejected at this point. During this step, the technician assigns the client-specific test code and the computer system assigns a laboratory ID number. This starts the internal chain of custody that is followed throughout the entire testing process for the specimen in the laboratory. The paperwork is forwarded to a separate order entry area where specific specimen information such as collector name, collection date, and donor ID are entered and verified. Meanwhile, the specimen is forwarded to the aliquoting station. An aliquot is a portion of a larger hole, especially one taken for analysis. The specimen is inspected for obvious signs of tampering, specifically any damage to the tamper evidence seal that was placed on the specimen by the collector. The tamper evidence seal is broken and the specimen itself is retrieved from the package and inspected for unusual appearance. A 20 milligram aliquot of the specimen is prepared using an analytical balance. The aliquot is transferred to a small tube. The specimen is washed with acetone, dried, and five to six stainless steel ball bearings are added. The tube is placed in a ball mill, which consists of a piston that moves in and out very rapidly. The action of the ball bearings on the nail reduces the nail to a fine powder. Methanol is added and the tube is placed in a warm, sonicating water bath for two hours. Sonication is applying sound energy to agitate particles in a sample. The warm, sonicating water bath helps the methanol penetrate into the small powder particles to extract the drug. Methanol is transferred to a tube and evaporated under a stream of nitrogen while incubating in a warm water bath. This leaves a dried residue in the bottom of the tube. The tubes with their dried residues are transferred to the initial testing section of the laboratory. The initial test is immunoassay, specifically ELISA. ELISA is a common laboratory technique which is used to measure the concentration of an analyte using antibodies or antigens in a solution. ELISA utilizes 
the binding properties of drug-specific antibodies. Drug present in a sample bind to the drug-specific antibodies. The extent of the binding can be traced by color change, which is proportional to the concentration of the drug in the sample. The residues are dissolved in buffer and are loaded onto the robotic pipetting station. The robot transfers very precise amounts of sample in chemicals for analysis to the ELISA plates. Once the final solution for the process is added, the color change is observed. A dark yellow well is negative and the intensity of the color decreases with increasing concentration of drug. The plates are placed in a plate reader where the absorbance of a particular wavelength of light is measured for each well. The results are uploaded to the computer system, reviewed, and verified by two different laboratory technicians. The specimens that are negative for all drug classes are reported at this time by a negative certifying scientist. When a specimen does not test negative for a particular drug class, the ID numbers are sent back to the receiving area to initiate confirmation testing. The initial specimen is retrieved, its identity is re-verified, and a new aliquot is prepared from the original specimen. The initial sample prep process is repeated on the new specimen aliquot, including weighing, washing, drying, powdering, and extracting with an extraction solvent. However, for the confirmation test, the extract must be first purified and concentrated using a solid phase extraction technique for LCMSMS analysis. Once extracted, sealed vials are transferred to the confirmation section for analysis. The vials are loaded onto the liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry or LCMSMS instrument. LCMSMS is the gold standard confirmation technique for confirming the presence of most drugs of abuse in biological fluids and tissues. Details on how that works is beyond the scope of this presentation, but it is important to know that it is the gold standard for most hair conformations because of its high degree of specificity. LCMSMS uses mass spectrometry to identify specific compounds, and a mass spectrum for a compound is as unique to a compound as a fingerprint is to a human being. Following confirmation testing and two levels of data review, a positive certifying scientist reviews all of the data, both screening and confirmation, and all of the chain of custody, both internal and external. If all of the chain of custody is intact and documented appropriately, and all of the data satisfy all of our quality criteria, a final report is issued to the client. As a last line of defense for the donor, the original specimen is maintained under chain of custody for one year for the purpose of referee or retesting. USDTL maintains a dedicated client advocate group to assist you with any aspect of your drug testing program and can provide the proper resources to you to answer any of your questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, uh, for uh, sharing your afternoon with us um, and, and to see how we perform uh, fingernail testing. And so now I'd like to open up uh, uh, for our question and answer period. And uh, Megan will, will read our first question to us from the field. How do I ensure that I have achieved the minimum specimen volume for testing fingernails? That's a very good question. Um, if the fingernails are two millimeters thick on each clipping, which is the thickness of a quarter, and if you collect all 10 fingernails of that length, you will have 100 milligrams on average. And 100 milligrams allows us to do the screen test and the confirmation test for a number of different um, uh, uh, drug classes. Uh, and, and, and so sometimes we run out if you're positive for three or four, so the more sample you can get to us, the better, but we, we can certainly use a little less than 100, but we certainly encourage uh, to send in at least 100 milligrams. Invest in a gem scale, 
Uh, they're relatively inexpensive, and I have one here to show you. Uh, these are little uh, uh, scales that you can purchase from the Internet. If you would like to email client services, they have a link to send to you. And um, it's just a simple little scale. And uh, they're good uh, down to sub-milligram. So determining whether you've got 90 or 100 milligrams of specimen um, is, uh, can be very useful. Joe, is it acceptable to mix fingernails and toenails is it, if there isn't enough of each the other? We request not to do that. And the reason being is that down the road, we will be asked to interpret the data. And if we do not know where the specimen came from, that can affect the turnaround time dramatically, and it can affect the threshold to positivity as well. So we make a screen with one portion and be positive and confirm with another and it be negative just because it was two different sample types. Please do not mix uh, fingernails and toenails. Uh, at the time, it seems like a good solution, but down the road, trust me, it's more trouble than it's worth. If the, if the donor has artificial acrylics, can I still continue with the specimen collection? No, artificial acrylics are not fingernail, so number one, they would be negative. Number two, they would uh, yuck up my instruments, so to speak, because they would dissolve in the organic solvents and, uh, and, and mess up some very expensive equipment. Um, the whole question with cosmetic treatment, the original data that, that, that we were aware of and data that we had generated demonstrated to us that fingernail polish and, uh, uh, and, and other treatments did not affect the, the test. However, um, there are gel treatments and other treatments that uh, apply a very thick coating and in, in trying to determine once the clipping is here in the lab, trying to determine is it just polish or is it some sort of gel coating where when we weigh out a portion of the sample, the majority of it is gel as opposed to nail sample uh, can make for big problems. So uh, last year or year before last, uh, we reissued um, our collection instructions and just said, you know, um, remove all of the cosmetic treatment. Let's just get it off. Um, if they are some of these uh, fancier types of, of treatments, let them go to their uh, 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 nail person and get them professionally removed and then come back for collection. And that way we know what we got and we know that we'll get a, a, a better accurate result. Okay, on that same question, um, what type of solution should be used to remove fingernail polish? You want to use a non-ethanol containing uh, fingernail polish. Studies have shown that ethanol applied to the fingernail will not create ETG, but it offers a combative donor an opportunity to raise a red flag during litigation down the road. So just to completely eliminate the possibility of red herring arguments down the road. Make sure that your fingernail polish remover does not contain ethanol. They make both kinds. Why is the window of detection so much longer than hair? Good question. The detection window in head hair is based on the growth rate and the growth pattern of head hair. Head hair as opposed to body hair the majority of it is in a constant state of growth at any time that you do a collection. And most of the hair grows at approximately a half inch a month. So when we collect the hair sample from the head, we know that most of that hair is in an active growing state and that an inch and a half segment of that hair represents approximately three months of hair growth for most people. Um, Drugs begin to leach out due to normal daily hygiene and exposure to the elements once it's been incorporated in the hair. There's also variables with hair color. Uh, the, the, the darker the hair, the tighter it binds, so it may leach out a little slower than someone with lighter colored hair. So the detection window for hair is up to approximately three months for an inch and a half of head hair. For body hair, uh, that's not the case. The growth rates are different, but not that different. But the main difference is that the hair, the majority of the hair is not in a growing, uh, growing state. It's in a dormant state. So that hair from a body collection could be as old as a year. 
And for some drugs that stick around in dark, coarse hair better than others, you may be looking at drug that's been there for a year. Fingernails, on the other hand, um, when, the drug, when the nail is formed in the germinal matrix, which is back here, um, drug is incorporated at that point. And as the nail grows outward, not only does it grow out, but it grows in thickness as well. And from the underside, material is being added, included drugs of abuse. So when the fingernail reaches the end of the fingertip, that portion of nail that you clip has been growing and moving along that nail bed for four to six months. It's going to depend on the health of the individual. So when we get a positive, we have to say that the detection window could be up to approximately six months. For toenails, for the same reason, 12 to 14 months. Um, does it mean that it was actually in there? We know that with ETG, it's shorter. Uh, ETG is very water soluble. So as you wash your hands, you act, you're actually extracting some of it out. Thankfully, fingernails are very thick. And so uh, uh, penetrating in and extracting it out is very difficult. And uh, toenails are even thicker and you don't wash your feet as much as you wash your hands. However, there's not a lot of data with ETG fingernails, so I shouldn't have mentioned that. But, um, but, but that's the reason for the difference of detection window. It has to do with the age of the specimen that is being collected, harvested, and sent in for analysis. So if someone cuts their nails down to the quick, how long do I have to wait for them to grow out, and is the window of detection the same? Good question. Yeah, give them two or three weeks, and that new emergent clipping or distal edge will be fresh material that's going to be representative of the six months prior to the, uh, uh, to the collection. Are, are fingernail drug tests admissible in court? Yes, I've testified uh, in many states. Uh, I don't have a, a list on me, but I've testified in at least four or five states and used fingernail results and, uh, and one toenail uh, in New York. I remember that one. Why do you need all ten nails? Can I send in just nine or one really long nail? How long? I'm kidding. Um, the, uh, yes, if, if, if you only have nine, go ahead. It's all about the weight. We encourage 10 because 2 millimeters times 10 is going to give us the, um, the 100 milligrams that, that we like to get. Uh, but send us what you got, and we'll do the best that we can with what we receive. Do you have any tips to avoid flinging fingernails during the collection process? Um, one thing you can do is have the donor wash his hands prior to the collection, and that uh, uh, keeps the nail from being so dry and brittle. Uh, you're not going to wash out uh, 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 any uh, significant amount of drug, if at all. Uh, number two, uh, you can prepare like a little tent out of paper and, uh, and have them hold their hand under that uh, while they do the collection. But sometimes they just get away from you. What does quantity not sufficient to confirm mean on a laboratory report? Yes, good question. Uh, in order for us to call a sample forensically positive, it has to be forensically defensible. What does that mean? That means that we need to analyze that specimen using two completely different analytical, method analytical methodologies, if available, and those results have to agree and, of course, done under chain of custody. We do the initial immunoassay screen, and fortunately that test is very, very, very sensitive because with one little tiny portion of specimen, we can screen it simultaneously for 5, 7, 9, 12, 14, 15 drug classes. For the confirmation, though, that's a little different. Where we're really sensitive with the screen, the confirmation is really specific. And, and what that means is that we're actually identifying the compounds, and, and the compound itself is being quantitative. So we need, for each confirmation, an additional 20 milligrams of specimen. So if we receive 40 milligrams of specimen, and we screen it using the first 20, and it screams, screens presumptive positive for two or three drugs, we have enough to do one confirmation, but not the other one or two confirmations. So we're at a dilemma here on our end. In the vast majority of the cases, you're sending us what you got, and we we understand that. Uh, the alternative matrices all have this problem, whether it's oral fluid, hair, or fingernail. So that's a, a common problem. 
We can't call it negative because it didn't screen negative. We can't call it positive because it's not confirmed. And so uh, the middle ground that we feel we've struck is that for drug classes where we were unable to complete the confirmation, we will cancel that drug class and give you the other drugs. In the vast majority of the cases, the information from the other drug classes uh, is sufficient for you to move forward. Uh, for instance, if you have a child custody case and you've got a parent that's positive for both methamp and cocaine, and we had enough to do the cocaine, but not enough to do the methamp. The cocaine is probably enough that for you to move forward, or you could go back and request more specimen at a later date for us to try to confirm out the drug that we were not able to confirm out. So it gives you a couple of options as opposed to just rejecting the entire specimen and you not having access to the information that we had access to uh, during processing. What does unusual appearance mean on a laboratory report? And can we still continue processing yep. of the specimen? You know, uh, uh, some of the uh, polishes and stains that are used um, uh, in manicures, um, some of them are obviously easier to remove than others. Um, and we, we, we've had this issue where we'll get fingernails in uh, that have color to them. And what we don't know um, is, is that residue left from the fingernail polish and, and, and not a big deal? Or has someone come up with something to paint their fingernails with in an attempt to beat the test? Um, we don't know of such an uh, angle at this time, but trust me, someone will figure it out and <laughs> we'll be talking about this in a couple of years. Um, it's too much, too much at stake. But uh, what we are attempting to do is saying that this is not clear fingernail. There's a color to it that should not be natural. That's not a natural color. We are merely letting you know. Some of our clients want to know this, um, and, uh, and, and some actually go ahead and reject. But we are we basically are letting you know as quickly as we can that we have an unusually colored specimen. We want you to know, and then you can um, uh, uh, send back a request to client services, cancel the result, or perhaps uh, go ahead and process. It's totally up to you. Um, I would recommend going ahead and processing and, and see what we find. But then at the end of the day, we have documented that we observed an unusual color. And that result was reported to you as expeditiously as possible through the reporting system that we have. And then you have the opportunity to reply. Six months down the road, we may not remember all of this. But because we've now made this part of the transaction record between our two organizations, um, it's a permanent record that we can refer back to. We may find out in six months, oh, yes, this slightly orange stuff is something that's being purchased over the Internet. Well, then we can go back to some of those and, and, and find out what was going on. Uh, so so that's, that's the main purpose for that is, is just to let you know as quickly as possible and not play phone tag and he said, she said, and all that. So this is a, it's a, it's a report back to you immediately. Is it wrong to remove the nail polish at the collection site or should it be done before arriving at the site? The nail polish can be done uh, 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 at either place. Uh, I'm sure you don't have all day to be a manicurist. Um, I would request my donors, if, if I were operating a collection site, I would request my donors to remove it before they got there, but um, I would be prepared to do it. Acrylics and gels and that kind of a thing, I, I would send them back to their, to their manicurist to, to, uh, to have that done. Is there a split specimen with nails? Uh, not really. You know, could you theoretically do it? Yes. Uh, you could um, have an A and a B portion, uh, but the logistics of that is just not reasonable. Usually getting enough specimen to do all of the testing that we need um, and have a little bit left over for referee testing is, um, is usually as far as we can get. Um, but if you want to do splits, that would be fine, but 
you, you may run into more Q&S issues than, than if you did it otherwise. We do preserve the sample. We have it here for one year. And so if it needs to be retested or if it needs to be sent out for referee testing, that's fine. Um, but I would be sensitive to the quantity not sufficient issue. Is there any way someone can adulterate a test such as soaking the fingernails in bleach? I would assume so, um, but it's not been documented. Uh, that would be something that I would probably try if I had something I wanted to hide. I don't. But, uh, if I did, that would be uh, one way to go. Uh, but uh, there's not been any studies on that, and that's probably a good opportunity for a, uh, for a research project that would have value. Is there any potential for surface contamination of the nail sample causing a positive test? Yeah, good question. Um, there is no literature on this subject with fingernail. There's, there's, ton, there's, there's well, still not a ton, but there's a lot, of, lot more data with hair as far as environmental exposure. Um, from my experience dealing with parent-child combos, um, it appears that environmental exposure is more difficult to pick up with the fingernail. And to me, that makes sense because uh, the structure of the nail, it's, it's a beta pleated sheet as opposed to a, a helical uh, keratin, which that's the difference between hair and fingernail is this is alpha helical and, and this is beta pleated sheet. So it's a, it's a flat plane type of structure. It's, more, it's, it's harder, so it's more difficult for the drug to get in and penetrate, but it does get in and penetrate. Uh, I, I do see children who are clearly not smoking crack uh, positive for, for cocaine and benzalecanine in their fingernails. Uh, that is due to environmental exposure, uh, but the numbers tend to not be as high, and, um, and, and I, I see more negatives under certain circumstances than I would with the experience that I have with testing hair. Um, fingernail is, um, is thick, and if the drug does not penetrate through, you're washing your hands, so it seems to me it would be easier. Not only is it more difficult to get in, it's a if it does get on or in, it's a little easier to get off because it's going to be in the top layers. There was a nice presentation at the Society of Hair Testing in Toronto about three years ago. And they were taking the fingernails, um, pulling the whole fingernail from uh, deceased uh, cocaine users. And, and what they found was that as they shaved the fingernail and collected those different shavings, um, the deeper that the shavings went, uh, the concentrations dropped off. And what I was thinking in the back row at that meeting was that those top rows were probably representing environmental exposure because of the guy was handling it and maybe snorting it through a $100 bill or whatever, however he was doing it. So um, it's more difficult. Definitely still see it, though. We have to be aware of that. Is fingernail testing sensitive enough to pick up one-time use of a substance? Uh, yeah, that, that's outside of the scope of the fingernail test. With any of these tests, the way I kind of wrap my head around it is that the test is giving you information about the behavior of the individual over the detection window of the test. What does that mean? If you are pulled over coming back from a bar Saturday night and you blow a .08, does that mean that you're an alcoholic? Does that mean that you have a substance use disorder? Or does that mean in the past couple of hours you've had too many drinks? We all know what that means. The past couple of hours you've had too many drinks. That might have been the only time you've had a drink the past five years. So you, you don't have a substance use disorder. You're not an alcoholic. However, with a urine test, we're looking at what you've been doing over the last two or three days. While single doses may be picked up, it's more likely that you're going to be looking at more consistent usage. And you have to be abstinent for two or three days before you go negative. So that's giving you... What's been your behavior over the last two to three days? You may have been a raging cocaine addict two months ago, but your urine is dead negative now. The hair is going to give you that information over three months. So if someone does one line of cocaine two days ago and their urine's positive, the oral fluid's positive, but the hair's negative and the fingernail's negative, 
what does that tell us about the behavior of that individual over two days, three days, three months, six months? Clearly, they're not a cocaine addict over the last three to six months, or they'd have been using cocaine throughout the whole period of time. So that portion of their behavior is negative, but you do have evidence they've used recently. So if you keep in mind the detection windows is more descriptive of their overall behavior during the overall period of time, uh, in most cases, that will be a, a, a satisfactory interpretation. You will run into situations where it may be possible that given uh, a high enough dose or a correct enough dose and um, the timing of the collection, a single dose may show up. And so when you hear me testify and someone asks me, well, you know, the cocaine, benzalecadine, this and this, and in here, was this person exposed over the whole period of time? Or were they simply, they said they used it once, and I said, well, you know, I, I can't tell you. Uh, it could have been just that once. Probably not, but I can't say it's impossible. So it's kind of how you have to frame those questions. Why do you have the donor cut the nail rather than the collector? So you don't cut them. That's the nice thing about um, oral fluid collections. That's the nice thing about fingernail collections and uh, phosphatidyl ethanol blood spots is that each and every collection is a true observed collection. The collector is watching the donor collect their own sample. Um, with the hair, that's a direct observed, but you're going around to the back of the head um, and you're having to collect that sample yourself. And uh, sometimes I joke that it's the back of the head so they can't see what you're doing because uh, most people don't like having a haircut. But at any rate, from the back of the head, that's where all the, all the research is. But, you know, in case you nick them or cut them or they're diabetic and they're not telling you or have peripheral artery disease, you're not telling them, or they don't tell you, it can, it can save you some trouble down the road. Just let them cut their nails. Uh, they know how far they can cut without hurting themselves without you. Um, you've got a business to run. You're not a trained manicurist. What, what types of testing are best suited for fingernail testing? For example, is it pre-employment, random, court? Reasonable suspicion? Um, that's a good question. Um, if, 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 I were, if, if I were owner of a manufacturing plant with, say, 500,000 people, I would, I would turn to a pre-employment strategy uh, for hair and fingernail. And I would leave it open so that your uh, for liquorly challenged men, like I'm rapidly becoming, uh, have a sample type, and then, but then I have the problem, I bite my fingernails. So if you leave both options open, you can get a greater deal of compliance. And, and that's really what you're wanting in a, in a program. You want the program to move forward without a lot of intervention and, uh, and handholding. So if you allow, you know, pick one as the primary, and have uh, uh, the other as a backup, as a pre-employment. I like that because it has the long window of detection and it picks up the environmental exposure. Um, I'm not interested in hiring a supervisor who allows his kids to smoke dope in the basement. If he can't control his home space, uh, he certainly can't control my workspace for me. So I find that information extremely valuable and you don't get that with oral fluid or urine. Uh, for random, um, since these people are already on your payroll, and you have a good idea of what's going on with them to some degree. Uh, the quickest, easiest, cheapest way to go, in my opinion, is a urine test, although the longer matrices could be useful under certain circumstances. And then the uh, post-accident reasonable suspicion, you can't beat oral fluid. And so uh, uh, that's going to give you an opportunity to have that, that uh, short detection window, and it's also going to give you the opportunity for, uh, per se, under the influence, if you find the parent drug in the in the oral fluid, that means it was in the blood. That means they were to some degree under the influence. Maybe not intoxicated, but definitely under the influence. So what I'm talking about is an integrated uh, drug testing program. And, 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 and I, I view our job is to provide as many tools for your tool belt as possible. And under certain circumstances, um, uh, does that work? Uh, no, uh, but, but for a lot of them it would, and, uh, but I would encourage you to discuss all of these options uh, with the laboratory and, and um, 
and, and choose a program that best fits what you're trying to accomplish with your program. Are you compliant in all 50 states, and what does this new ISO certification mean? Yes, uh, we have a, a, a number of certificates. Uh, CLIA, uh, uh, Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, 1988-87. Uh, that is a federal certificate that um, ensures that there is a, a baseline of quality uh, management in place at the laboratory, and it allows the laboratory to do business across state lines. Um, the College of American Pathologists at Forensic Drug Testing um, is another certification, which actually they are the deeming body for the CLIA. So when you get your CAP certificate, you apply to your state with a check and, um, and you get your clear certificate along with your cap. Uh, a few states have uh, individualized certificates. Uh, Oklahoma's one, uh, New York is one, uh, Florida's one, Maryland, they're, they're, Iowa, there's a, another handful of states. Uh, only uh, New York has a similar requirement checklist such as cap or CLIA uh, to follow. Uh, the other guys are basically wanting your business information and, uh, and, and a check. And uh, so you send them, uh, you know, where you're at, where you're located, your, your federal ID number and, and a check, and, and you get the certificate to do business in New Mexico or wherever. Um, the ISO is an international crediting organization and uh, uh, international standards organization. In the 17025 is a forensic laboratory specific accreditation. And what that means is that using the guidelines that have been suggested by an international body for forensic lab work, um, that's what the 17025. Um, many state crime labs require ISO 17025 before you can do tests for their criminal courts. Civil courts is a different deal, proponents of the evidence and uh, just a license to do business in that state. or uh, a CAP certificate is, is generally what's required. So again, check with your state. Um, uh, we have a whole list of them. If, if there's one that we're not aware of, we'll be glad to look into it, but uh, we are set to go in all 50 states. Why don't you indicate the detection window of hair and nails on the laboratory report? Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I, I get this question a lot. And uh, The, I have worked in a urine drug testing laboratory for most of my career uh, prior to coming to this laboratory. And detection windows on urine reports are non-existent. And there's a reason. And that's because uh, it can vary from individual to individual. They can be mitigating circumstances. And once you put that subjective explanation on an objective document, then which is it? Is it a guess? Is it subjective? Is it objective? Uh, hair testing, um, while has approximate detection windows, that there's, there is a wide range of inter-individual variability that must be used in a final interpretation. And so whatever number you decide to put on the report, once you get more information, that information could be wrong. And you do not want to have your objective toxicology data with wrong information. No information is much better than wrong information. Um, so what, what that request implies is, is the desire for a letter of interpretation. That requires gathering a little bit more information. How long was the hair? What's the health of the person? What color was the hair? What drug are we talking about? They're all different and they all come into play. And over time, some of that information will change. It is subjective information. So uh, that's why we don't do it. Uh, when SAMHSA starts putting detection windows on their urine reports, then we will reconsider that. But for the time being, we do not put detection windows on any reports, not just hair, but urine, oral fluid, blood spots, the whole thing. 
Someone mentioned earlier about fingernails being adulterated by things like bleach or other solutions. Could someone do something similar to hair? Absolutely. Uh, uh, one of the first few collection instructions uh, for hair um, is do not collect obviously cosmetically treated hair. Bleaching, perming, dyeing, chemical straightening. Um, I know that some individuals will stand up and down, jump up and down and say, Cosmetic treatment does not interfere with the hair test. Yet, just yesterday, I was talking to a client who had a, um, oh, what was she? She was doing marijuana and, and cocaine. And it was sent to a lab that swears up and down that bleaching, perming, dyeing does not cause a positive. Yet, there was numerous urine positive, known history of cocaine and marijuana use, and the hair come back negative. Um, and the person dyes their hair. Um, two weeks later, a test was done. It was positive. The test was done two weeks later at another place. It was negative. And so uh, I told my client, what do you believe now? The scientific literature is, is clear. Um, there are several papers out there that actually describe what uh, bleaching, perming, dyeing turns methamphetamine into, such that you can't detect it in the laboratory. And um, a colleague of mine at the National Institute of Standards, um, uh, Janetta uh, uh, Pritchard, uh, she published a very thorough, eloquently uh, performed study of relaxing uh, hair relaxers on uh, the presence of cocaine in hair. And, um, and, and it kills it. Uh, same thing with bleach, with ETG, uh, bleaching, perming, dyeing. Um, those processes contain varying amounts of oxidizing and or reducing agents. And just like pouring bleach into pee can kill the drug, you put bleach on your hair, it's going to do the same thing. So that's the nice thing about fingernails is that if you have someone with obviously cosmetically, cosmetically treated hair, you can go to plan B and collect a fingernail. Um, and, and that's all I have to say about that. Nail ETG versus PET, phosphatidyl ethanol. Do you feel that one is more reliable than the other? It depends on your situation. The PETH is a little more sensitive than the ETG in the hair and the nail. Sometimes it's too sensitive. Um, someone who is engaged in social drinking may have low-level PETHs that we have to be aware of. And then the confounding factor is, um, is that from low-level social type drinking or is this eight days following a big binge? Same number. So it can confuse and confound, and it depends on what the program is trying to do. Also, uh, PETH disappears at a half-life of four and a half days. So someone can become negative pretty quickly uh, relative to an ETG in hair and nail, where the half-life is 21 to 25 days. So if you have someone who is chronically excessively consuming alcohol, uh, um, uh, the PETH is going to disappear somewhat faster um, uh, than the ETG in the hair of the nail. The ETG in the hair and nail is going to more than likely show, a more, remember, get back to the uh, behavior over the long period of time. And, um, and so the ETG in the hair and the nail is going to give you more of an idea of what this person has been doing over the long haul, whereas the PETH is going to be the past couple of weeks, and then carry that one more down to the ETG, ETS, and urine past couple of days. So uh, one of the little um, mnemonics that we have here in our lab is 333, uh, ETG in urine, PETH in, in, um, in blood spots, and ETG in hair and nail, three days, three weeks, three months. So you can remember that. Can you do a 10 panel nail and hair test? Yes. We go up to 17 panel. Yes. How important is it to use the chain of custody and control barcode seal? Oh, that's critical. Absolutely critical. That barcode seal is the principal primary um, forensic linkage to that information, number one, number two. The security seal has to be in place, and so it's one nice, easy thing 
You put that seal on there, it's tamper evident. When it gets here, we know that nobody's opened it, messed with it, monkeyed with it, swapped it out for, you know, their cat's hair or something. Um, and so we know that what the collector put in there is what we get out. That barcode seal is important because, as you saw in the previous video, the receiving person scans the paperwork, they scan that sample, and it's a force to match. It has to match or it stops the accessioning person right there and the specimen's canceled. Um, so we can't do anything until we get something to match that. So it's critical. That's the number one critical step in the process. Why was the specimen rejected for improper use of tamper evidence seal? Yes. If the tamper evidence seal is not affixed such that it seals the package, then it's not a tamper evidence seal. And um, um, I've seen cases where you have, just to put it in a, a simple case, a urine cup where instead of putting, instead of, you can't see my cup there, but um, instead of putting a seal over the top of the cup, so that, so that when you uh, 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 apply it or you try to open it, you break the seal, they'll put it around the cup so you can open and close the cup all you want to and not break the seal. These little uh, 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 stickies are not ordinary stickies. They're, they're tamper evident. And so, number one, it's got the barcode on there for you so you don't have to write anything down. And then number two, once it sticks, if you peel it, number one, it'll break in a couple of places, and number two, you can't stick it back. And so when we get it, it's obvious that someone's messed with the seal. It's rejected because we don't know what's going on, and, uh, and we have to make sure it's a good sample. If I ingest a substance today, how long will it take to reach the point in the fingernail for collection? Uh, there are some very good studies, none with the drugs of abuse that we deal with, but there is um, a very good series of studies, uh, most of them out of Italy. Uh, there's a pharmaceutical company over there that was working with, uh, um, um, with medicines for uh, nail funguses. And, uh, and, and this was data from years and years ago, so it, it, it was uh, totally missed by everybody that, that, that claims that you need to use nail shavings. Uh, as opposed to nail clippings, and you'll see what I mean. Um, when they gave these people uh, uh, these oral medications for their nail fungus, uh, they were expecting that you would have to wait four to six months to get a nail clipping before you would be able to detect that drug in the fingernail. And in order for that um, drug to be effective, it had to be at a certain concentration in the fingernail in order to kill the fungus in the fingernail. And to their surprise, what they found out was that after uh, uh, two to three weeks, they were finding that drug in fingernail clippings. And so how can that be? If it's only laid down by the germinal matrix and it doesn't get out there until um, uh, six months, how can it start showing up in clippings in two to three weeks? So uh, that was when the four roots of incorporation were... Um, were proposed, and that is from the germinal matrix, uh, from environmental exposure, which if it's a pill, that's, that's not going to be uh, uh, much of an opportunity there. But the sweat and the oil from the skin around the nail, uh, those fluids contain drug and drug metabolite uh, similar to urine, and that's much like the sweat and the oil from the scalp. Um, and, uh, and that's even more uh, exaggerated for toenail because it's uh, incubating in a nice, warm, humid sock all day. Uh, and then uh, lastly, which is the unique thing about the fingernail, is that as it's growing, as it's growing in length, it's growing in thickness, so drug is being added uh, from the bottom side. So when you get that clipping on the end, what they call the distal edge, when you get that clipping, the time period that's represented there is six months ago all the way up until about a week or two ago. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's quicker than most people think about. Drugs and hair start to show up in a few hours, but usually it takes the multiple mechanisms to overlap before there's enough there to detect. So is it possible for cocaine to show up in six hours after those? Yes, if it's enough, if the hair's dark enough, if they did enough. Usually it's going to be a couple of weeks when all three modes superimpose on top of each other and, and, uh, and uh, reach a maximum. Okay, this is the last question. Can we still continue testing of the specimen if it was canceled for improper collection? 
Uh, depends on the improper collection. Um, if um, if it's acrylics or if it's um, if the uh, tamper evidence seal was not applied properly or if the seal is not present, if there's no ID, uh, then no, it, it needs to be canceled because our certification is based on producing forensically uh, defensible results. And um, I'm just trying to think of an acceptable improper collection, but if it's improper collection, you, you don't you don't want to, you don't you don't want to move forward with it anyway. So no, I would just say no. That's it. Thank you guys so much. And this um, recording will be available next week. We'll uh, have it up on the website, as well as the collection video will be up on the website for all of those who asked for it. And thank you guys for joining us today, and I hope to talk to you soon.